So it is time for the monthly uh, project club. Today, Russ will be talking to us about his package Dupree and cleaning up code. Um, you, the sign up is available in the channel. There's still slots left for the end of the year. Um, next month, we have Federica. It's going to be talking to us about spatial modeling with Oregon frogs. And the month after that, Kevin Kent is going to be talking to us about video upload automation for RPDS. And I'm really looking forward to that for the month before that, because that means we're going to uh, both have to find the time to knock that out and get it done so he can talk about it. So, uh, all right. And with that, take it away, Russ. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks, John. Um, okay. Hopefully you can see both my browser window and the uh, presentation and my our studio uh, thing in the same thing is that right um yes so uh today um i'm going to be talking about a package that i wrote a long time ago and which i haven't really used a great deal since um but is um it's a package that i built on top of uh, an existing package called lintar um and it uses some of the tools within Lintar to pull out code blocks from packages or markdown documents or things like that, and finds um, blocks of code within there that are duplicated, that are presented multiple times, or that are presented where a very similar version of the same code is presented multiple times. And the reason for, that I was interested in doing this um was um was that um it's very easy to write and write and write and not realize that what you've written you've already written so you end up in a situation where you, you i mean you, you often see these presentations about if you write the similar code three times maybe you should refactor it into a function but if you don't realize you've written that code three times, say you're working on a package that you've been working on over a prolonged period, you may not realize that you're implementing something that's already in existence. So finding those um, points of duplication and also um, you, this isn't always um, duplicating exactly the code but finding sufficient similarity between different bo blocks of code that you can extract a more general purpose function that you can test better and that you can um, potentially use to speed up your workflow in, in subsequent uh, weeks. Anyway, so the package is called Dupree, um, and I'll talk about the name for it at the very end. Um, but what it intends to do here, this is two... Uh, an illustration of two blocks of code in the same project. Um, and the different colors kind of indicate different function calls or whatever you might have in that block of code. Um, as you can see, the two strands are virtually identical, but there's a couple of points of difference. This red is a green here. This purple is a green here. This purple is a... Oh, sorry. This violets are white here and this purples are green here so the the purpose is to take those two kind of similar blocks of code and extract a more kind of general purpose thing that you can plug in the relevant arguments so the only difference between these two you know illustrative blocks of code is that there's three points of difference between the, the the strands that's the high level view if that doesn't tweak your you know visual kind of needs i don't have a better illustration for what, <laughs> what we're doing um but anyway um so i'll i'll, I'll move on um oh yeah and the, the package is on cram it's under my name on GitHub, 
um and uh yeah i mean feel free to play around with it if if, if it's of interest um you can find me on twitter on linkedin i'm a data scientist at jumping rivers in the uk um and you know i do a little bit for alpha data science and more recently i'm a co-organizer for the leeds data science meetup um so how to use this package um so firstly you've got to install it now that it's on crown well it's been on crown for three years i think but you can install the 0.3 version from crown at the moment there hasn't been a great deal of development since then um and then load it into your workspace yes so the the the, the overall reason for this um is that uh, the, the, there's a lot of quotes like this in books about software design, about software quality and things like that. So books like Clean Code, um, Refactoring, Refactoring to Patterns, where I've got this quote from, and um, other things like, you know, your Jenny Bryan's talk from a couple of years ago that was great. Um, that what... It... A kind of you know good code to work with makes it obvious to the you know the the developer that's working with that code there should be no surprises there should be no hidden stuff there shouldn't be you shouldn't have to search through dozens of files to find the thing that you need to modify your function should be named correctly and stuff like that there's lots of kind of um touchy feely kind of w what it is about good code that makes it good code but ultimately what makes code bad is when it's hard to understand where it's complicated and where it's duplicated so the the, the problem with duplication is um, I've, I've worked on apps and packages and things where you might find similar code written uh, in two different functions, but only one of those functions ever gets called. There's dead code in there that, that may be worth deleting from the package. Um, duplication also you might see um, uh, in terms of like... <sighs> I've got a better picture for that. Hold on here um um so there are many different types of duplication that you'll find within code so a lot of this if you're if you're doing kind of exploratory data science and there's nothing wrong with 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 doing it and you've got a block of code that works for your needs and you want to tweak it and maybe you're generating a plot from some data set and you've got a block of code that um works for you and it's generating a plot as you need but you need to tweak a few things to generate a second plot you can copy and paste that block of code and reuse it if you do it more than once the the, the copying that is maybe you should rethink and, and write it as a function but that's basically the origin of a lot of duplication in code you might find other kind of accidental forms when uh, duplication arises, where you might implement a function twice or related functions or something like that. Um, yes, yeah, so there's many different forms of duplication. Um, but how do we detect it? So a lot of a lot of the the a lot of the time it's down to the developer to know that they've in you know um duplicated logic um and in r i've certainly found no tools um well I, at the time that i wrote dupree there were no tools that would identify um similar bits of code um there is uh a, 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 in python one of the main linters for Python has a um, 
uh, a check to see if there are identical lines in different positions in files. Um, the the more heavy duty languages where there are better uh, where there's better support for static analysis um, have loads of stuff for analyzing code structure and identity. But in R, I didn't find anything. And I thought it was a, an interesting and slightly complicated problem. So um, there are tools for doing string similarity or sequence similarity kind of analysis in R. There are things for uh, doing text analysis, for finding, um, you know, like kind of plagiarism type analysis. Um, and there are tools that do code static analysis or, 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 or um, uh, kind of clean up type work um like good practice and lintar and things but i haven't found anything that does um text duplication uh, code duplication analysis um okay yes so the main functions in this package are uh dupree where you pass in a vector of file names um dupree underscore dire for analyzing all R scripts or R markdown files in a directory um, and for analysis, analysis of the R code in a package. I chose these um, function names um, because they align with the function names used in Lintar. So there's a lintr function for working with individual files there's a lint dire function and there's a lint sub package um function so the reason it's uh <laughs> an abbreviated directory but a fully declared package may seem a little odd but i did it to match with what lintr do um anyway this is a script it may not be a typical script the the script's pretty simple um, but it's got some trivial duplication in it, and I'm going to use it as a little example to show how Dupree works. Um, so you've got a few different blocks of code in here, some to import a, a, a package, some to load in a data set, and then there's two blocks of code that do a kind of summary of that data set. So there's a slight difference in what you filter that data set on um but the kind of summarizing code is identical um so were you to copy and paste this a third time you ought to kind of think about about maybe writing a function or um but okay so that we'll just focus on the 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 top half of this script for now okay um so that code is stored in a, a in an r script and i'm going to run dupree on that script um there's another argument that i'll talk about later um so we run dupree on that convert it to a data table uh, to a tibble and then just plot out the results and what we find is um there's two blocks sorry there's two da, 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 how's it work the third block in that script and the fourth block in that script are identified as having a high degree of duplication so this duplication score varies from zero to one um and for us in in that setting it's, it's come out at 0.778 um which is pretty high um this final block here isn't something that i can handle yet in dupree so this is um sorry i can analyze code that looks like that but what i can't identify is that this code is exactly the same modulo using a pipe operator um 
So this is the piped version of this. Um, so all the, you know, so the summarized function is on the outside and then the group buys on the inside and, and whatnot in this version of the code. At present, Dupree can't distinguish between, can't identify that the logic in those two code blocks is the same, but it does identify that there's a little bit of similarity between this block and this block, um, which you see in this second line of the results. Um, so the results that come out, hold on, have I got it in? Um, I'll show you what the results look at, like in a, in a bit more detail towards the end of the, the talk. Um, uh, but you can get the name of the file, the line on that file where the code block starts, uh, sorry, where one of the code blocks starts and when the second code block starts and the number of the code block within that file um, and a kind of comparison score of how similar they are. Um, I, wa I wanted to go through the mechanics of it because I think it's quite interesting and I think, you, you know, you might find it more interesting than the actual results of running it, to be honest. Um, um, so I, I've actually, the, the, the steps, I'm going to show you the mechanics of how Dupree takes the script, splits it up into chunks, enumerates uh, encodes those chunks in such a way that it can find duplications within them and then how it finds duplications within those encoded chunks right the steps have been changed for clarity because it'd be easier for you as a person to follow the similarity of the code than it would be for a computer so the first step in the um the 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 computational step is to convert these um, different symbols into integers. And it, it it's less motivating to just see similarity between a string of integers, I think, um, for, for you. Um, anyway, so this is the first half of that script that I showed. Right. Um, the first thing that happens is you find the blocks within that code. And the way that works, that we um, leave that to Lintar to do. So it identifies um, um, entire statements within um, the script or set of scripts. So library dplyr, if this was a, um, a JavaScript type language, you might put a semicolon at the end of that. And we'll that's the thing we're looking for here. The blocks of code are the things that might end in a semicolon in a more strictly um, um, syntax language than R. Um, so that's the first code block, the second code block, the third and the fourth. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, the second step that we do is we drop things that are too small. So if you've got multiple scripts in a project, say, and a lot of those scripts, the kind of preamble to them involve loading tidyverse or loading dplyr or something like that, you don't want to identify duplication on a, a trivial level like that. So I, 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 I remove code blocks that are too small. Um, based on a measure of size that, that that's based on some encoding that we do that I'll explain in a minute. Um, so the only two blocks that are kept here, are this block three and block four. Um, and we remove symbols that don't add any kind of kind of semantic meaning to to the statement. So um, as far as R is concerned, a open bracket is a, um, a you know, in the, the kind of past code, an open bracket is 
uh, you know, its own line in that that. Like, so, how to explain this? R takes a block of code like this and constructs a data structure from it, um, and be before it actually um, evaluates the, the the code. And there are things that are passed in that data structure that don't necessarily um, were I to do kind of duplicate comparison might uh, just cause it to identify a lot of false positives. So I remove things like open braces, commas, um, equal signs, and things like that. So removing those trivial symbols makes the code look like this. I do, it, there's a, a list of kind of symbols that get filtered out in, in the Dupree source code. Um, Okay, and then the final thing is that we convert those individual symbols across all the scripts that you pass into Dupree. It identifies each symbol used and converts it to an integer. Um, and so every time diamonds is used across all of those scripts, it's given a particular number. Every time filter is used, it's given another number. Um, that that can be a problem because a lot of functions use the same argument name x. A lot of um, other things are, are, are duplicated for be, because of the, the the kind of generic way that we write functions in R. But um, that's the best I could do at the time. Um, anyway, so these all get converted into vectors of strings. So this is block three this is block four um so we've had diamonds converted to one the pipe symbol converted to two um filter to three and so on so that's the pipe symbol again um so that's block three and block four is very similar so you can see as a kind of observer that you know the, the the source code that we started with has ended up as a kind of data structure. These are going to get flattened into um, a, a single vector of integers for each code block. And then what we do is we align them. Now, I did a lot of bioinformatics, a lot of genomics in the past. I don't do any anymore. But um, aligning stuff is very important to us. Um, and um, what we've done here, what I've used is one of the simplest methods for aligning um, two sequences. So you look for the longest common subsequence or the longest common string. Longest common substring is typically how it's raised in computer science between two um, vectors. So it's between two strings. So this is a vector of integers representing code block three, a vector of integers representing code block four, and we try and find the longest common substring between the two, which is diamonds, pipe, filter, and then group by blah, 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 summarize. Um, the bit where they differ, there's no alignment there. Um, and we use this which is mostly written in C++ um, and does sequence similarity between, you can pass it a list contain, where each element in that list is a vector of integers. So I can enumerate the, uh, sorry, yeah, I can enumerate the code in every code block in a package, generate a list of vectors of integers where each vector comes from a, a given code block and then do sequence similarity between each pair of um, vectors. So that's, it's pretty expensive. Running longest common substring is pretty expensive for a long string anyway. Um, and running that on all pairwise blocks of 
code in a package or a project or something it couldn't be quite expensive but um i'm sure there are ways to speed it up but i, I I'm, I'm not hugely worried about uh efficiency for something that you wouldn't necessarily be running every day um yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. So the, the, the reason it comes out with this number here, you have um, a string of a particular length here and a string of a particular length here. Um, and the distance between them, to my knowledge, is the number of unmatched symbols. So here it would be 5, 8, divided by the sum of the input sequence lengths. Um, I think that it, I think it might be, it, it's, it's close to that. It might be twice that or something like that. Um, but that's, so that means if every symbol in one string matches with every symbol in another, there's no unmatched symbols and you have a distance of zero. So this would come out as zero. If, um, none of the symbols in one string matched with any of the symbols in the other, you would end up with um, the length of sequence one plus the length of sequence two divided by the length of sequence one plus sequence two, and it would come out as one. So the distances vary from zero to one. So it's not a strict mathematical metric or anything, but... Um, to, to my knowledge, at least, I don't. I don't think it could be, um, but yeah. So um, anyway, so that's that, and and yeah, and and so what we do is we find all the code blocks, encode them in a particular way, identify similarities using this uh, encoded version of the code blocks, and then present a data structure that contains the most similar code blocks within that um, um, package or project. Um, to run that on a package, I, I didn't want to run this on a random package because I don't want to look like I'm like mocking anyone's code or anything like that. So, you know, um, because really like finding duplication and removing duplication, it. <clears throat> It's not as important as um, getting code to work. Um, cleaning it up at the end of the day is is useful, but like you know, ending up with good code that that people can work with and can understand is is somewhat better. So you shouldn't just be like removing code to reduce the lines of code in a project. You should be removing code to. Um, make that project more simple to follow. And if you can't think of a way to simplify the code, then don't remove the duplication. Um, if it makes it too abstract to work with, it's it's on balance, it's probably not worth removing the duplication. So you will find a lot of duplication in open source projects, but it's probably not detrimental to that project. Um, but uh so i ran it on lintar and the reason i chose lintar is i'm an author of lintar even though i've not done a great deal on it since version two came out but um uh you know i've got some kind of association with the project so you know i'm a, i'm allowed to analyze its source code and not feel like i'm bullying it um right anyway so here we go i've um cloned the current version of Lintar into a, a directory and then ran um, the you know package level analysis of the Lintar code. What you end up with is something that has this um, uh, class, uh, which I should probably have picked a better variable name since it's the same as the class name, but um, it's just for an example anyway. Um, you can convert those you can convert that class to a table, to, you know, if you want to analyze the results in a, in more detail. Um, this probably doesn't look the best. So you've got the different file names. 
uh, blocks and the position of those blocks within that and the the the, the um, similarity score between those. So there's two files here that have a um, a pretty high level of similarity. And and similarly, there's quite a few others that um, I think it's just the first 10 that are shown here. Um, but those those first three lines of that table are the most highly duplicated blocks of code in this project. Um, so the cutoff, I think, I would normally put in at 0.4. Did I include that here? Oh, no, I didn't include a threshold. You can specify a, 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 a lower bound for the size of the functions that you want to analyze or code blocks that you want to analyze. And that block size is based on the length of the integer encodings of the code blocks. If something's smaller than 40 integers, then it gets thrown out here. Um, you can also set a threshold for, for similarity so that, you know, if you set it to 0 0.5, any code blocks that have a si similarity less than 0 0.5 will be thrown away. Um, yes, this is a slightly neater way of looking at the results. So, um, so there's only six pairs of code blocks in that project where the similarity score is above 0 0.4, and you can identify the specific files and the specific lines if you want to go in and clean up that code slightly. Um, yeah. Um, so we can actually visualize these results. Um, so in order to do that, I've, it, this part of the talk uh, is um, limited by my abilities with Tidygraph. Um, so, it, you know, it's not it, the, the visualization at the end might not be the best but we'll work towards it anyway um so we've started with that data frame of duplication results um filtered them and then um we present a uh we construct a a, a, a kind of tidy graph um object and we modify the node names within that. So I'm trying to make a nodes and edges type graph of duplication within a package. Um, right. Uh, and to generate that image, we're going to use ggraph, which has a similar kind of um, API to ggplot. Um, Okay, so what we've got, we've got lots of different little code block pairs. Some things where you've got multiple code blocks together, where there's like duplication between three or four or five different code blocks. And it's when you find these kind of triplicates that maybe you should start worrying, particularly if they're very highly uh, so, so the the edge weights here depend upon the similarity score between them. So this triplet here is a very highly there's very high similarity between each of the three functions in there, um, and we can actually look at the uh, file names by um, labeling them with um, is it gg repel? I think it is. Um, yeah, so so that's, you know, the project as a whole and, and the purpose of it. Now, I've got lots of ideas that I'd like to implement, and I've got a few bugs that I've identified that, that need fixing and things. Um, uh, while I was an hour ago, no, not an hour ago now, an hour and a half ago, um, I was trying to get that. Uh, package level analysis to run 
and it was just failing because I um I was running something along the lines of duping package of slash temp slash lintar and it was failing because there's a, a regular expression that like filters the files that are found um based on the r subdirectory within this um thing but it expands the home directory squiggle into for me slash home slash rose so the regular expression was throwing out all the files that were present in this temporary directory um and nothing was getting analyzed uh, and I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> all my data frames are empty. And I'm, like, presenting this in, like, half an hour. Um, uh, yeah, I'll fix that bug. But, um, yeah, I, I think handling file paths and things like that, is, it, it, it probably isn't great. And I don't think the package is particularly well suited to Windows users as, at present. But um, the Dupree and the Dupree Dyer um, functions should work fine. But Dupree package probably won't work that well um yes uh so i mentioned a few things so don't know if anyone's used pre-commit pre-commits are really uh, very close to our heart so this is a tool that you use um in a, in a project that will run a, a set of commands whenever you make a uh, git commit so in a, in a typical work project, I might have it running style R, um, check that you haven't committed large files, um, run lintar on any changed files, um, and, and various things like that. So nothing particularly computationally demanding, so not like running all of your test suite or, or something or your... Um, um, R command check or anything like that, something, you know, that would hold up your um, workflow, but something that can run within 10 seconds and you'll get back to coding so that you can catch minor styling issues and things like that quite quickly. I love pre-commit. Um, what I'd like to do is implement some way of including Dupree as a pre-commit hook for me to check that it's not identifying lots of false positives and things, and then eventually to make that more widely available. Um, because I think it might be quite useful because the, the, the issue with this package as a whole is what are its use cases? Its use cases are like, as a um, consultant, you might be given a, a project to work on. You might want to do a quick analysis of the code that's in there, find um, any, you know, functions that could probably be replaced with, uh, you know, a fewer, um, you know, whether you, where you can replace three or four functions with a single one. Um, find, uh, I think, so that's like a one-off analysis. Um, and what I'd like to do, and, and also, you know, if you've written a load of code and you'd then want to check, oh, have I rewritten something that pre-existed in this, in this, uh, package or this project, you can run it and it'll work. And I, I was wanting to write an R studio add-in to do that kind of thing, similar to, you know, um, uh, like the style R add-ins and the lint are adding um and it, i think that'll be quite fun to do because i've never done that kind of stuff before um but i don't think that would be where i would find the most value from this package i think the the most value i would get from this package is from it telling me you've already written this this function not from me having to ask it have i already written this function so by including it in a pre-commit hook i can get you know if i find 
three implementations of the same code somewhere in that project have pre-commit tell me you've written the same you know these lines of code are 80 90 percent similar across three different positions in your project please rethink your design because if it ran on uh ran automatically in, uh, on commit it would be closer to the point at which you're writing the code and it would be a check on the design of your code but i do worry that that might it might flag up a lot of false positives and it might annoy people and you know if john yeah just uh i i like the idea a lot uh your caveats i think make sense i mean i I think uh, I am willing to be a guinea pig, not turning on the pre-commit, but just start actively using it yeah, and see yeah. how often it would be annoying. Like yeah. if it's being over, over picky, like if there could be a way to kind of um, turn, like set the limit on the pre-commit mm. hook and then, you know, e either the user does that or you, you know, do yeah, some work you, to kind yeah, of dial it, that in. It would certainly be possible to configure that uh, because um, the way the pre-commit hooks work, so like the, the style R hook, um, uh, you aren't obliged to use like the tidyverse style. You can right. provide right. a function name as an argument to the pre-commit hook and it will use your, so internally we have a, um, we have a, a work style uh, that's embedded in a function and you can use that to style your code. So you're not tied to right. uh, So I could certainly make it like you could pass in a parameter that says um, minimum sequence identity of 0.85 or something like that, um, which would be pretty um, stringent, I think. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, so I think that's I think that's a, a, a good place to go uh, for yeah. this, and also like making it simpler to create the kind of summaries and and and, and reports and this. I, I was quite keen to have a look into making a kind of shiny app that could present these kind of results, but I also worry that like it's you know it's possibly a package that no one's actually ever going to use. But I saw the download numbers and like it's been right. downloaded 20,000 times or something and I thought well that's mental cuz this is it, I mean <laughs> it, 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 all it's going to do is tell people off why would they want <laughs> Well that's all of those, you know. Yeah. Like uh, all, the, the the things that good practice runs mm, all yeah. of them are telling you that you're wrong, you know. Yeah, so yeah. uh yeah, I think good no, practice I like is a similar a kind of idea to what I was talking about before because it it takes such a long time to run good practice. Right. That it's the kind of tool that people will turn off if they're on a project that requires it until pushing, you know. If if right. it runs on commit, people won't want to use it. If you are obliged to run it before you make a you know, a push or a commit or something, people will stop doing that until the very point that they make a pull <laughs> request or something. And and like that kind of easily turned off tool is, is easily forgotten about, I, I think, in a, a, a development. So, I mean, it's a lovely tool. I, it made it made me a much better R programmer when I started to use it because I started to use it and like work you know bioinformatics projects six or seven years ago it was brilliant but it was also quite it it, it ran because it runs our command check and various other things it takes quite a while to run so it was only running it a few times a day but um yeah um yes oh what's in a name <laughs> um so uh dupree where did it come from it was dupe because it identifies duplicates, although I am intending to identify triplicates as well, because the 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 rule of thumb is if you've written something three times, that's when you refactor your code. Because if you've only written something twice, you haven't hit 
the amount of generality that you know to to write your function to to meet um so it should really be finding triplicates but you know um do r it's got an r in the name which is always <laughs> a benefit uh for for an r package it's entirely lowercase and a short <laughs> word um so that's why i chose the the package name but also it is named for one of my like piano heroes <laughs> um uh, a, a chap called uh champion jack dupree who was like a kind of heavyweight boxer and uh be became a pianist later in life and kind of released a lot of albums in like the 50s and 60s i i live um in a in a part of england um that i moved to two or three years ago now um where my partner grew up um and it, so i didn't grow up here and i, I didn't realize I was reading like the Wikipedia page for for Champion Jack Dupree a couple of days ago as a you know just to see if there was anything I could mention in the talk about this package. <laughs> and he moved to somewhere like 10 miles from here <laughs> in the 70s. He like fell in love with an English girl in London and moved from you know moved over and moved to like Halifax, which is like our nearest big town. Um I was gobsmacked because like you know I've play blues piano in like various kind of you know pub nights around here anyway so it's named after a, a hero of mine but the name also includes what it does and are which is the the dream for a package <laughs> um yeah um yeah so i don't know i mean i was quite enjoyed talking about it but i don't know whether it'll be uh because you know this isn't like um package net and good practice and things it's not as well it it's not <laughs> gus oh i just i have some thoughts um uh-huh i've been writing notes so mm. the the thing about like when it runs i've been harassing myself with corto preview a lot which yeah every time you save the file it'll just throw it'll just update in the viewer and so if you were to have it sort of running as a background and then every time you save whatever you're writing, mm. it'll just run real quick and then pop yeah. something up in the viewer. Um, yeah. When you said parentheses, commas, and so on are removed, I was thinking about taking out like stop words and text mining. Yeah, yeah. Just as like a way to wrap my head around it where you just kind of want the important bits. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but it's a, it, entirely the same thing. Uh, to be honest, I think the... Um, the 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 symbols that get removed the types of expressions that get filtered yeah. in in this probably could be expanded i think there's a lot of additional things that are you know um superfluous that might be worth removing but i haven't expanded the set yet what i'd like to do is to run this on hundreds of packages and find right. out where it <laughs> where it would be a bugbear uh, i mean there is the uh cran mirror organization mm. on uh on github yeah. that you know you could do something there yeah um i did have a project a, a few years ago where i would took all of the repositories in um the the package development task view that was kind of unofficial that someone maintained on on github pages or something like that and every repository that was mentioned in there so things like dev tools and use this and lintar and so on and um extracted the git repository for each of them and it, what i was actually doing was looking at you know the kind of social history of the the repositories so like who was committing when who was touching which file would pairs of files getting touched in the same commit or you know things like that um because i just thought it might be quite interesting as a kind of side project um but uh, uh and i think maybe it might be worth applying this to the you know in that kind of way of, of hitting 80 or 90 packages 
and and getting a a report about just those packages um rather than running it on 20,000 cram packages and um but yeah uh, um uh, yes yeah so definitely yeah uh, sorry connor's mentioned something in the mm -hmm. chat that about how this might be a useful tool for identifying places where students could improve their code um and and i guess that is possible but i think what it might be good for is if you know if student a is reviewing student b's work or or, or something like that i i think it would only be because the problem is if if it's just used to kind of point out replication but there isn't someone in the loop to say actually have you considered that you could rewrite it like this have you considered if it if it's just there as a kind of pain point i don't think it will be doing its job but but certainly if this is you know students have just learned to write functions and they're given a script that contains a bit of duplication um identifying that using a, a tool like this would be quite useful and would be a motivating example for them to develop functions i think yeah i could see it being interesting like to run it on like a family of packages to find uh like basically find the missing package like hey all of these should be importing a package that exports this because they all yeah. write the yeah. same function yeah now that is something i haven't done yet um i i could identify the individual files in two packages and yeah. pass all of those files to the function here but it would be nice to have a um a way to say analyze all of these packages at once because it's just a shorthand for doing the same thing and and yeah. certainly yeah if the there are commonly written utility functions or something okay. across you know all the http api type packages or something like that that might be something that's worth bringing out into a second package or something yeah i you know i i, I wonder all right, go ahead. I, was, um, I, I was thinking about the opposite like if i'm working on a problem and i've got some functions i've written that that are just local to my, my machine and i'm thinking about how to um you make the make the code better mm -hmm. you could run this like if you had a, a local cache of of all the say all the packages in cran or, or just all the packages in some topic yeah and then you, you could compare your local code to the code that's in that topic in cran and see if that function's already been written yeah 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 no i agree um yeah, yeah. It, it, it is possible i suspect that might melt your computer given its current implementation but certainly that would be possible yeah <laughs> um yeah um there are places where this isn't a it it does fail somewhat um for very long functions so the problem with functions with it at the moment is that there's no way to split up blocks that are nested inside other blocks so an entire fun an entire function body would be converted as a single block at present um what i'm trying to think of a good way to do is impose a kind of maximum block size above which the parent block gets split into child blocks um be, because you know but also but again if your functions are that long that this is it that that this isn't a good tool for you to use your functions being that long is your <laughs> main worry point um uh yeah <laughs> but, um yeah so uh, but i i do think that it's important to be able to have a kind of uh way of 
dealing with nested blocks, but, but uh, I, I haven't thought of the best way to do it yet. Um, when when you're talking about the piping stuff and you said that you couldn't different, like you couldn't tell that something piped and something flattened was the same. Mm. In the base R pipe, if you run substitute, it will flatten the function call. But yeah. I haven't been able to do that with the tidyverse pipe. And like, yeah. so like okay. base pipe, it would be, yeah. And then if you pipe that very last into um, a substitute, it will flatten it. Okay. Well, what I'm actually interested to see is whether the the pipe is depiped before the code is enumerated. Because I'm, I'm, I, I, I think this might end up being identical to this. That's it, yeah, from yes. Dupree's perspective. It should, um, I, it should be, yeah. Uh, we should, um, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> which one is it again? Identification, maybe. Oh, what's happened here? Oh, it's failed. What have I done wrong? <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll change directory and try it again. Not quite what I've gone wrong. I think there are also a few of like the database um, packages. So like I think like dbplyr, maybe sparkly r, they mm -hmm. have a way that evaluates the tidyverse pipe. I just don't know what it is, and I'm not. I don't think they necessarily expose it. Yeah, I, I know they're doing it because they're able to convert the whole pipeline into like SQL code. So it, it's happening somewhere. I'm just not sure where. Okay. Um, <laughs> do, 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 do. Min block size. Why oh, that didn't work? There's a problem with live coding is the stuff that you've that fails that you've hidden. Um, <laughs> uh, so what's happened here? The final block is uh, lines nine and twenty one. Um, so in here, line twenty one and line so it's line fourteen. And line nine, a scene to be, yeah, no, it's not quite worked correctly. So these two blocks are seen to be right. virtually identical. Whereas if the 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 passing, sorry, the passing of the pipe had been done, um, prior to analysis these two blocks would be done so it, i think it's i i think i'll probably have the same issue with the native pipe as i have with the yeah um you would need pipe. to to actually like execute it mm. in order um yeah 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 um but i think i so i, I can't remember exactly the, the details of the you know whether we're working with the um raw text of the um code or whether we're working with the call. precisely which lexer is used prior yeah. to this but there's something internally in lintar that calls something else that you yeah. know it, it, um but it is it is quite interesting to see um but yeah i think i i i think it might um be something that's fixable so that you know the 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 pipes get depassed and everything but i think it would have to be able to also work for the tidyverse pipe because um i think you know if people are writing a, a project in one style maybe you know a piped style rather than a nested style then they will continue to write in that piped yeah. style and it's probably you know N not hugely of, a, of an issue. But, um, I think uh, like if you can only do that for the base pipe, like that's 
one of the advantages of the base pipe. So, mm, yeah, yeah. you know, that's don't don't feel bad about that. You know, <laughs> like that's why it exists or why it works that way. Yeah, because yeah. it does the um, like whatever the interpreter sees it as if it were not there. I just checked, and I don't think substitute will actually evaluate the code because I tried right. doing something that the base pipe should yell at me. And then I substituted mm. at the end and it didn't yell at me. So I think that's relatively safe. You can you can even just, so just put it in. you can pipe directly to the substitute as well. Yeah. So yeah, it, okay. It flattens it so out. I could yeah, yeah, yeah. So I could feasibly call substitute and substitute is as base as the native pipe isn't it so <laughs> yeah um yeah i could i could substitute the um code prior my, to passing it into the, the my, code my hacky way thinking and extending this would be what if you took someone's code with the tidyverse pipe and then just replaced all yeah. of the tidyverse pipes with base pipes <laughs> and then substituted just to see how it flattens mm. yeah so, it might break yeah like technically their code might break, but you don't care. Yeah, what exactly. you're doing. So like yeah. it feels illegal, but <laughs> I think it would work. Anyway, you know, it's it's uh, cool. Oh, go ahead, Connor. Um, I never remember, but just one one other thought. Um like this seems like a generalizable unsupervised learning problem by finding similarities in clusters. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you could also like take the approach of like a tidy text topic modeling approach where right. like each function is a document or each script is a, is a document yeah yeah and look at the actual words in the code not not worry about the, the parsing tree or whatnot yeah but yeah. If, if if it's if the if each function contains diamonds and group by and summarize and mean and sd it wouldn't matter like what order they're in or whether it's nested yeah, yeah, yeah. or not. Yeah. It sees the words. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, it, 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 um, it, in terms of like, you could take a package and cluster different uh, scripts within it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, that, that would be quite interesting to see. I think that would might maybe be a, 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 a second project. Uh, I, I, I don't think I want to extend this into um, NLP or, well, not natural, but, you know, mm -hmm. syntactic language processing or whatever you'd call it. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a good idea. Cool. Right. Anyway, thanks everyone for coming right, along yes. and having a see at this because it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's it, I really haven't done much development on it since my daughter was born to be honest and that's like four years ago um but yeah i think it's uh it, it's due an another release soon and there's enough bugs and there's enough new ideas that i'll probably sort that out soon um cool very cool all right well nice. thank you and we'll see everyone uh next month bye